Welcome to Radio Free Sunroot. You're listening to the interview podcast, Voices for Nature and Peace, where we discuss issues of ecology, empire, justice, and consciousness. We feature a variety of guests who are aware of the challenges of our time and who are working to address them. Here's your host, Calibri Ter Sonnenblum. What is sustainability, really? Featuring Christine Mattis. Christine Mattis received her PhD in environmental studies. As an interdisciplinary environmental scholar with a background in biology, earth system science, and policy, her research focuses on environmental risk information and science communication. Before returning to graduate school, Christine worked as a medical researcher, as a science reporter for the U.S. Congressional Record, and as a science and health teacher. She has no relation to the Mad Dog General. This is Christine's second appearance on the podcast. I invited her to be the co-host of this episode, so she came up with a list of questions about the concept of sustainability, and we took off from there, covering so-called green energy, belief versus knowledge, scientism, indigenous life ways, the pandemic, the complications of technology, climate chaos, the loss of childhood experienced in nature, propaganda and media, lack of local food sovereignty, the urge towards escapism, the desire for a simpler life, and the need to redesign the American lifestyle. So I really like the list of questions that you sent, and did you want to start talking from one of those today? Whatever you want to do. Uh (laughs) I'm open. Okay. This question... Right at the top, how do we define sustainability? Who defines it? Is it actually sustainable? And how has the term been bastardized? Yeah, well, one of the reasons I brought that up, and I haven't been able to, I haven't had the time to do the writing I want to do, but um, I, you know, I, I got my PhD, and basically, it's called environment and resources. But you know, really, it's sustainability studies. And And looking into um, work in sustainability, you find that sustainability has actually sort of been defined by the dominant society. And it's not, it's probably not what people think it is. Or maybe it is what people think it is. But if you're, if you're actually, um, say, an ecologist, what people define as sustainable isn't sustainable at all, you know? Right. So, so, yeah. So there's a, uh, are you basically talking about like a, a corporate? view or definition of sustainability when you say I would that? Say it, I would say it's corporate and the, the corporate view has been incorporated into um, government and official policy because if you look at, I mean, the major cities have offices and, and states have offices of sustainability now and even small municipalities and they all use that sort of corporate definition and they're all, they're all really looking for corporate people. You know, they're not hiring people with environmental studies degrees. They're hiring people with uh, business degrees. Right, right. Yeah, so, I, yeah. I've run into, I mean, obviously what we all have, but I mean, I've, I've run into that a lot, what you're talking about and seen it a lot. I mean, you know, living in Portland, there was a lot of that kind of talk going on as well as there being real, you know, grassroots movements. But I think maybe what you're talking about there is – what they really mean is the sustainability of the system. How can we sustain this system? Not how can we sustain life on the planet, which is what I would consider to be real sustainability. Right. So it's, I mean, there, it obviously touches upon the environment, but I think you're right. It's more about how can we do something slightly for our environment while sustaining our system? Whereas, you know, the grassroots movements and, and, you know, people at large probably are looking for how can we sustain this planet for our children and their children and so on. So I'm not sure that everybody understands how sustainability is defined. And really, the people who are defining it are the people in power, both at the top of corporations, at the top of government levels, and even at the top of sort of the mainstream environmental groups. 
Right. Well, there's that whole, you know, NGO complex that, you know, like, you know, uh, have you read Corey Morningstar's work at all? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. I mean, now now I don't agree with 100% of the conclusions that she comes to, but the research that she does showing all the connections uh, between the big, you know, philanthropic so-called uh, funders, you know what I mean? And then all these mm-hmm. organizations and then the limitations that these organizations put on themselves. That's all very real. What she talked about real. there. Yeah. Yes. And- I agree with you about her work. I don't always agree with her conclusions, but yeah, I mean, she's spot on with this sort of NGO industrial complex uh, tied to these major philanthropic foundations that were, and so many of them are um, the foundations of people who've made it in the corporate world and their, you know, this is their legacy. This is their sort of capitalist philanthropic legacy. And of course the irony is the reason they have all this money to create their foundations is because they've done all this damage and the damage that they're supposedly helping to thwart is the same damage that they've created. Right. Yeah, totally. I mean, and then, then of course, once we're talking about sustaining the system, primarily and not and only secondarily sustaining the environment and that totally affects the kind of solutions that they're going to suggest you know exactly so That's so right. we yeah we end up with you know what i find to be really perverse you know which is the the big green you know so called green energy projects you know like the the mm-hmm. huge solar projects the huge wind projects you know the fact that some people call um, uh, dams, you know, hydropower, that they call that sustainable. Right. You know, right. The, the the worst part where you've got people like, you know, George Monbiot saying that nuclear is sustainable, yep. you know, because yeah. it doesn't put out carbon, you know. I right. mean, I mean, to, 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 to pretend that we've figured out the problem with nuclear waste and to pretend that you know, all of their uranium mining and, and uh, you know, and now they're saying, oh, we don't need uranium anymore. We you can use thorium and we have the fourth generation. None of this accounts for the exploitation of people and the people who are harmed in the process of creating these um, plants, the, the money that goes into it that we all pl- pay, the potential, the risk potential, which I know really well because I grew up and currently I'm I'm right near uh I was about a mile or two away from one of the big nuclear plants in New York, right outside of New York City, and I'm still now again um, several miles away. And it was, it's always been a threat. Most recently, because it's like past its exploration date, and it's finally going to be decommissioned. And who knows how much of a risk the decommissioning is going to be? But it was a huge threat on 9/11, and it was a potential target of terrorists. And um, and and really, uh, there's never been big studies on on the health effects of you know the the minute amounts of tritium and other nuclear um, sort of I don't want to call it waste, but there's always a bit of nuclear particulate, if you want to call it, that comes from these plants that may be affecting com- the community. Um, and then there's also what happens to the waste now that it's be, being decomm- decommissioned. The, the interesting thing about nuclear power plants, too, I just want to bring this up because I was really following it. There was several years ago, there was supposed to be a huge comprehensive study by the federal government on the effects, um, the potential health effects of nuclear power on people who sort of live near all these nuclear power plants. And uh, suddenly they decided to drop that study, and apparently they said it was it was just too costly. But I really, I really wonder what the real reason for dropping that study was, and I really wonder if they already know that the um, that the the risks and that the maybe the epidemiological data they have show that there were increased, you know, cancer or various other uh, health effects in these particular regions because i know the cancer rate in the region where i grew up is fairly high but of course we have so many other potential um uh, carcinogens so who knows what it's from still it's it's just questionable why they dropped this whole study which is very valuable or could have been very valuable 
Right. And I've, you know, heard people make connections too between the cancer spike, the general rise in cancer that began in the United States, you know, or was noticed in the United States starting from the 60s onward. And the fact that, you know, there were several hundred above ground nuclear tests that took place in the late 50s into the early 60s. Right. So that's a whole, you know, and of course, how could we say that nuclear weapons tests have not contributed to cancers? That's that's just absurd that we know we're dropping all of all of this radioactive material and no one's being affected by it in terms of the nuclear power plants. um, You know, people in my area would say they're completely safe. And, you know, I, I know many people, including my father, who's been into the plant and, you know, has had themselves tested with the Geiger counters and say, you know, it's completely safe. You go in and out, nothing happens. It's um, and that there's nothing being leaked. But, you know, that is that's extremely questionable. And we just have to rely on, you know, officials, most of whom have stakes within this kind of energy and within maintaining it to assure us of its safety when we don't really have the scientific testing behind it or the public health testing. Well, yeah. And speaking of that, isn't there, I mean, there's kind of this myth of um, non-politicized science or science for the sake of science or just pure science, maybe as people think about it, you know? Absolutely. Where we don't have the answers to some of these questions um, because they've never been pursued in that way. Exactly. Just as I'm saying, we don't have the answers to, you know, have have people had increased cancer rates in areas where nuclear power plants exist. No one's done that research. So oftentimes what we do is we say no when the research hasn't even been done. And then there's also the fact that the research can't always be done. We don't have the data. For example, I will say I I actually um, suffered from cancer. I, I don't want to really say suffered. I had a cancer incident. It wasn't really much suffering, um, knock on wood, for me. But um, I, I left where I grew up near that nuclear power plant um, 30 years ago. So I hadn't been living in that area for a long time. And when I had my cancer, I was far from there. And so wherever my cancer was registered in the data, it was actually registered in a place that I only lived for two years. So I wouldn't even be connected to the incidence of cancer in that area, even though that's where I grew up and spent my formative years. That's when I was growing and developing and, you know, I could have been exposed to something. So even if we do this research, there are so many factors that may not make the research completely valid. Right. And and then there's so that we have incomplete science and then mm-hmm. we have uh, a cultural faith in science that is seemingly ignorant of how science actually is working. Absolutely. So like I said, there's there's a great deal of uncertainty in the data. For example, what I just mentioned, we, we don't factor in a lot of variables that would need to be factored in. But, you know, there's there's outright corruption in science where people are doing science and and really coming to conclusions based upon who is funding them. It's called the funding effect. And it does it does happen. And then there's um, then there's science that is being done wrong. And there are certain certain scientists. There's a huge, huge crisis for actually right now that is known as the replication crisis, especially in uh, fields like psychology and biomedical research. But part of that is that science is not being done correctly. Uh, statistical analysis in, isn't being used correctly. And then part of it is that there's this publish or perish model within academia that people are just rushing to get these studies done and they're doing them sloppily and they're trying to, you know, they're building their career and they're trying to move up on the ladder and they're trying to make a name for themselves. So there's all these factors that go into science that we kind of neglect and just say, science, it's wonderful. And I've actually written a piece on this, if anybody wants to read it. Um, And um, yeah, please... um well, let me know what I'll that ha- is. I can't and I'll even put, remember. I know, but you can you it. can tell me later, and I'll put the link in the show notes for people to see. 
that would be great. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, there's there's so much to, to, for and what we have is like the Democrats saying we believe in science. And we even hear this from like um, the climate movement, too. We believe in science. And then we have the as opposed to what they're saying, the Republicans, they don't believe in science at all. Well, you know, science is far more nuanced than that. And if you know anything about it and you know about, you know, funding and research and and just people in general, you know, scientists are people. They actually do have biases. And the best way to do science is to disclose your bias to be, from the beginning. Um, but more than that, there are um, political incentives, there are economic incentives, there are career incentives that that taint science. And this is just the way it is. And then there's just mistakes and sloppiness and a whole lot of other things that happen. So to say that you just believe in science means you really don't know how it's working. And, you know, of course, not believing in science is not good either. But th- we really need to have a much more nuanced conversation. And there is Actually, going back to other research, there's research to show that when uh, citizens hear from uh, scientists who talk about like the uncertainty within their research and um, what they don't really know, and if they if scientists talk about their research with less certainty and more, well, this is kind of provisional, and we know this for these reasons, but there's there's factors we couldn't put in here, so. We have to treat this more provisionally. People believe in it more because that's really what the truth about how it is. It's not black or white. We, In fact, in science, you don't say you've proven something. You say it's suggested that this is how it is. It's always provisional. That's a really important distinction. And I think that most people are unaware of that. Mm -hmm. I I grew up uh, in... in, um, in Omaha, Nebraska, and I went to a, a college prep school. It was like a snooty college prep school run by Jesuits, you know, like all, <laughs> all, like all the all the rich kids went there, and I was not one of I, the rich kids, you know. I had the same upbringing. I went <laughs> to sort of a snooty college prep school, and I with a bunch of rich kids. I was not one of them, so right. yeah, I, <laughs> I know exactly. What it's right, like. right, and there was um, there was definitely and and the the crowd I was hanging out with within that happened to be like the like the the smarter kids who were like trying to get into the really good schools right you know mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. so i i right away uh i i sort of started to see this intellectual snobbery that exists as sort of a class thing you know mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and just for the fun of it and i wasn't trying to be obnoxious and i was just having fun i'd go around at parties you know uh, uh you know and um at high school where my high school friends were that crowd, and then afterwards when we were still knowing each other, and I'd say, okay, so can you prove to me on a bar napkin that the earth goes around the sun, not the other way around? <laughs> not that I don't believe the earth goes around the sun, but can you prove it to me on a bar napkin, you know? Mm-hmm. And and uh, I, I think I was only taken up on this once, you know? Out of mm-hmm. the dozens and dozens of times I asked it. and And, you know, the whole point of the joke was, well, you know, here's people who consider themselves rational and scientific, you know, and yet when it comes to this particular thing, it is a belief, you know, and it's a belief for good reasons, one could say, right? Uh, and, and that it's not coming out of a 6,000 year old book and you know what I mean, et cetera, right? But mm-hmm. still that there is this aspect of belief or faith or something like faith there, you know? Yep. Yes, and actually, it's it's known as scientism. Ah. It, there's a there's a belief in sort of the infallibility of science, and it's it in some ways when it gets to its extreme, it can be as you know as detrimental to society as the belief in religion and in you know whatever other um, dis- unproven kind of beliefs we have. Right. And then there's this idea that it's only us modern people who have been employing reason or logic to solve problems as yes. well, which is also odd. I, I remember reading this book and it was talking about uh, indigenous uh, methods of uh, ecological, uh, you know, like land management, you know, and mm-hmm. it was talking about how in this particular area, there would be particular people who were assigned 
to keep an eye on the beavers because they would hunt the beavers for their pelts and I believe for their meat too or what else, whatever else, right? But beaver populations tend to fluctuate from year to year, right? So you'd have people who that was their thing is that they were um, on hand like there, like watching the beavers all the time. Like how many <laughs> are there this year? How are they behaving? What are they doing that's different than before? And what they found was that it was that first of all, their knowledge was amazing, you know, and they mm -hmm. had incredible memories. And, you know, this is all observation. That's like, well, like that's step number one in the scientific method, right? And so, yep. uh, and, 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 and then, uh, in one case, they tried to introduce the use of spreadsheets to help them to track this information and found that they could do it better without it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I well, th there's a lot of things to say about that. First of all, in sociology um, and the sociology of science talks about a lot of this kind of stuff um, that there are there are other ways of knowing. You know, we talk about situated knowledge where you're in the situation and you know it better than people who come in from a different situation and try to apply, say, the scientific method and indigenous knowledge, of course. And um there's another uh, similar incident like that, and I, I feel like I may have talked about it with you before, but I'm not sure if it was you. Um, there's after Chernobyl, they were trying to figure out um, when it would be safe for, for the sheep to graze in the English countryside, um, which had some of the fallout of Chernobyl. And scientists were doing all these calculations, and they just, they didn't know... Um, how this livestock agriculture worked. And so they really couldn't figure out when is it safe? When will we, the fallout be safe? What are the different conditions that would apply to the safety at, over time? And the only way they could figure it out was just with the knowledge of the actual sheep herders. They knew better than the scientists the conditions upon which these sheep graze and where they go and what would happen to this nuclear fallout. And so, I mean, this, this, I guess it's the enlightenment belief in science above all else is really, it's really rather troublesome. Um, Vandana Shiva also talks about this, and she says sometimes we've, we've, I, I, I'm going to paraphrase her, but she says something to the effect of we've taken our ability to observe and our senses, what we know from our senses, and we've kind of thrown that out for this scientific reason and the, this data and this use of the scientific method. So sometimes what you see in front of your eyes, what you smell, what you taste, you're told that that's not really the way it is through science, and it's just absolutely absur absurd. Um, and so there, we really need to find a way, I think, to bring all of this together. We've, we've really made the world into this quantitative, big data sort of driven machine. And we, in doing this, we factor out all of the qualitative data and we factor out all these variables that we can't get from that quantitative data. But we're all driven by these numbers and these numbers do not tell the full story. I mean, I even know this from the research I did in my um in my master's and doctoral work, I did a combination of quantitative and qualitative because the quantitative data did not tell the story and it was much more nuanced and there were things missing from it. Um, so I think we need to remember that in our society and, and really be a little skeptical and maybe just inform ourselves. And when we look at this quantitative data that we're getting, you know, it could be, it could be totally valid and spot on, but oftentimes there's, there's variables missing that are unaccounted for. And oftentimes it's very easy for, you don't need a PhD, you don't need a master's, you don't even need a bachelor's to see it. You can see what's missing, especially if you're the people who live it, which is oftentimes what's going on because the people in academia are studying it and the rest of the citizens, the rest of us are living it. So, Right, yeah, like in, in climate science, I understand, for example, there's a divide between the laboratory people running the models and then the field people who are out there doing the measurements and doing the observations. And the people in the field tend to have a much more dire 
uh, outlook on where the climate is going than the model people do. Right. And part of that speaks to the conservatism in science. Um, they're always, and in statistics, it's always, um, you know, you, when you show the models, you're going to, sh- you're going to sort of account for the least amount of risk and, and you're always going to be conservative in your risk estimates. And, and I, this is so terrible, but I think some of this came from like, um, Dr. Paul Ehrlich, you know, the population bomb that he mm, right. put out in the seventies. And, and it wasn't, I, I would say that his theory was correct. His time frame might have not been, but, um, but, you know, he overestimated the population problem and when we would be uh, having dire consequences from our overpopulation. And because of that, no one wants to overestimate something. It's always underestimated. So that's part of the thing with climate change. And, and we see it right now. I mean, I know I was studying climate 10, 15 years ago, and all of the IPCC estimations were under um estimated as to what would be happening when. And right now we are at what they call the worst case scenario projections. But beyond that, I know also know, having used some models, that there are many factors that either are um, we don't have full data to input the models or we can't can't even input in these models. So there's missing data that can affect um, what the projections are. Uh, so I'm intrigued by the part where you said there's things that that uh, we can't include. Yeah, I mean, you know, we're using these these computer models and I can't speak to the specifics of I, I haven't been doing this. I, I only did it um, as a project in in a class, probably one semester, and I haven't used the model since. But I know that, you know, we were inputting certain factors, say they're economic and ecological, but these are computer systems and we, you know, we are human beings and we are in uh, an ecosystem and we can't account for all the changes in what we do socially, um, what other animals and plants do biologically. We, we can't even you know, think about what might happen sometimes. So not all of this is put into these models. And so, uh, and I, I would assume especially what's missing is often how humans react and what we're doing socially and politically that, you know, really can't necessarily be accounted for, but certainly affects what's going to happen with our climate or what is happening. Right. So the, the um, unpredictability of human behavior. Right, right. Yeah, well, that, that's a big one because there's there's things that, that people do as groups and as individuals all the time that are uh, seem unforeseen, you know, or are, are mm-hmm. surprising or seem spontaneous, you know, and they are, they are things that can't always be, be traced. They do seem to just kind of come out of nowhere, you know? Mm-hmm. Or, you know, like, this global pandemic, you know, and mm-hmm. if we have something even worse where we have to completely shut down the world again, you know, we're not to say that we were lucky in terms of where we're at, what, 180 something thousand people have right. died in the United States. So mm-hmm. this is horrible. But what's interesting is this is a highly contagious pandemic, but not a highly um, lethal one. If we had a highly contagious and highly lethal pandemic, then things would completely change in terms of how we're reacting to it. And and that it's not um, unlikely that that may happen, given that we're not changing our way of life. We are the ones who are sort of, by the way, we're living in the first world. We're promoting these pandemics. We're, we're making the, the foundation for them to be more and more likely. So to have a contagious and lethal one we've had like this one is highly contagious not too lethal we've had ones that like um i think it was h1n1 that's that was pretty lethal but not very contagious but to have the two worst factors combined it's not unlikely that that will happen in the future and interestingly enough that could change the projections for what might happen with climate and with 
our ecological breakdown if we have to really shut down the world to try to prevent us all from dying from a pathogen. So all of these unforeseen things could happen. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, absolutely. And the, the pandemic was beneficial, even if uh, to a limited degree, and even just for a short amount of time to the environment of the planet, because there was less, you know, human activity, economic mm -hmm. activity going on. And human, you know, economic activity within the industrial and the technological cultures is, you know, all of it is destructive, uh, mm -hmm. unavoidably so. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, you know, that that's, that's what we kind of start to come around to, of course, if we t talk about these things long enough, is that if we want to talk about what's sustainable, um, you know, this level of civilization is not sustainable. Exactly, exactly. And we, we're trying our damnedest to sustain our civilization while also saying that we want to sustain our, you know, biosphere. And it, it's just not possible. And that's what I mean, I was going to say that people don't want to realize that, but I'm sure you hear from people and I hear from people all the time who realize that it's the people in power who are benefiting the most um, socially and financially who do not want to um, face that fact. And it's to all of our peril, including, you know, their descendants. So, I mean, it's just delusional to think we can maintain this level of a socioeconomic system and also find a way to be sustainable. And I don't think, I think a lot of the people with power and wealth actually know this. This is why um, Jeff Bezos is saying we need to, um, we actually, I'm not sure if he's saying we need to colonize another planet or um, live on a like intergalactic space vehicle that if you, if you, Watch the Frontline documentary on Amazon.com. He talks about this, and he's always thought we have to launch ourselves into space. And it's it's clear, you know, the destruction going on by all of our first world industrial systems, including Amazon.com, is not ecologically sustainable. It's not sustainable for life on the planet. And he's looking for other ways to sustain life because he knows it. And I think Elon Musk is exactly the same. He's looking to colonize other planets. So people in power know this, but they're just not willing to give up their power and their wealth and their uh, their opulence in this, you know, current way of life. Right, and then the 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 media machine that they control, either directly through funding mm -hmm. or or indirectly through their cultural influence, you know, uh, also. Yep. Um, narrows the scope of discussion to the point where it's not even including any of the solutions that actually would be needed to to truly be sustainable. Right. I mean, uh, you know, what we what I've seen in in um municipalities and and local city governments and state governments in their office of sustainability, or even at universities that have offices of sustainability. And we, we have these sustainability offices in all sorts of institutions and in government. And they're not really the, what they focus on is green energy as they deem green energy, you know, hydro, solar, wind, um, and building efficiency, um, Sometimes they might talk about agriculture a little bit, but or and also, you know, changing modes of transportation, perhaps, you know, changing the fleet of buses to uh, gas powered and, or electric or um, building more, you know, municipal transportation. But none of it is in ecological terms, actually sustainable. None of it really speaks to our resource use and our overproduction and overconsumption and how we're taxing the planet um, and our ecological footprints, whether on a grand scale or on a personal scale. So the the term and the definition of sustainability with the, in these departments is really um, not what, you know, I'm not sure who 
would think that is the correct definition of sustainability, but it's probably not what all the citizens think the sustainability means. Citizens as in people who who want to see things change for the better, you mean? Yeah, and people who are who are really concerned about the futures for their children and grandchildren and so on. Um, you know, they're really worried about the warming of the planet and the, and the toxification and pollution. And I, I don't see all of these issues being tackled in these sustainability departments there. And as we've probably talked about before, they're mainly focusing on climate. And that's not to say that's not an important focus, but a lot of the things we're doing or we're saying as solutions to our climate situation are so ecologically detrimental in other ways and will contribute to more um, toxic pollution and more um, <clears throat> extinction of species and more ecological degradation as a whole. Yeah, because I wonder, I mean, how how sustainable, like we could look at, let, let's, let's just look at wind and solar for a minute, right? Those mm -hmm. are two, the two favorites, right? And those are pointed out as being sustainable. And yet, how different are they from a coal plant, you know? So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, a coal plant, you know, there's the damage of going and digging up the coal, obviously, which is just terrific, you know? And then mm -hmm. taking it there and then burning it. And then there's the, then there's the pollution, which can cause acid rain and all sorts of things like this. With the solar and with the, uh, wind, you're also, you, you have that end of it too, the first part of it, where mm -hmm. you have the ecosystem destruction that's happening to mine the parts to build that stuff, you know? And right. solar especially uses like some different rare earth minerals, I believe, you know? Yep. That, you know, are not infinite in supply and that there's, well, there's just these horror stories about, you know, the child labor, some of it child slave labor that's going on in Africa to, 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 to produce some of this, you know? Absolutely. Right? I was going to bring that up. And then there's the, right now we're starting deep sea mining oh, into the deepest parts of the ocean to mm -hmm. gather some of these uh, materials. Yeah. It's, it's really, well, you know, it's as though nothing has value other than humans. Yeah, yeah. It is what it is. And then really, when you look at it, only certain humans, you know, because right. these children, you know, the children in Africa, you know, under slave labor to get the rare earth metals for the solar panels, they are simply a cost of doing business. I mean, you don't see this, this disgust, you know? Exactly. And then, exactly. you know, when you build one of these you know, big solar or wind arrays out in, you know, out in the middle of the desert, for example, where it's a really popular place to do it, you completely destroy, in most cases, the ecosystem that already exists there. Mm -hmm. And then you have to build these power transmission lines, which themselves are destroying habitat the entire way, and which are inefficient in that they lose energy the whole way. And then there are certain solar plants out there that have been complete failures, that have not worked, mm -hmm. you know, uh, that mm -hmm. are just standing out there, um, shut down and unused and uncleaned up at this point, you know, all the while people are talking about solar and, 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 and wind as being these good things. And I mean, it just, I've spent and a lot of time in the desert and they're beautiful. It's a beautiful, there's beautiful places out there that, that should not be destroyed. And there's a thriving ecosystem of flora and fauna out there, too, that yeah, people oh, yes. forget. But, mm -hmm. I mean, they're also, you know, they they want to build all these um, wind and turbines out in the ocean, off the coasts. Um, I know primarily in the East Coast I've heard about it more than probably the West Coast. But, you know, putting a huge wind turbine in the ocean and, like you said, all the transmission lines that come from it, that is destroying that ecosystem and so it's you know obviously wind and solar are not going to have the um carbon emissions that coal or natural gas do right. but there's so many other factors that we just do not think of the exploitation of the environment the exploitation of people to gather the resources and if you've ever seen i mean i've driven across the country and seen these wind turbines 
going across, I mean, blade by blade, these humongous blades being driven on the interstate. And you look at that and you, first of all, you think of the resources to create this one blade and then you see it on the back of a, a, you know, a flatbed truck, but it's a hugely oversized truck. And you think this is not sustainability. And, you know, it, it would be one thing if we thought about tiny little wind turbines that fit on everybody's homes and tidy little solar. And even those have some problems. But we always have to have this industrial infrastructure. And part of that is because of capitalism and the consolidation of wealth. Um, but, you know, there are alternatives to at least try to make this truly sustainable. But one of the factors is always going to be decreasing consumption. You know, we don't need all these things we make. We don't need all these things we have. We we probably have enough goods and services um, aside from food, which we always need to have more of. The rest of the things we have created in this industrial world probably are enough to sustain everyone on the planet for quite a long time. But the only reason we keep making these things is because of capitalism. Yes, yes. Over at um, Basin and Range Watch, I don't know if you've heard of them. There's some activists in Nevada who are mm -hmm. um, they're trying to defend the desert from the giant projects. And they, they talk about this all the time, how the first thing we need to do is decrease our, our consumption and our need for energy. And one of those things is just making places more efficient, you know, mm -hmm. like, yeah. you know, when, when Obama put out his all of you know all of the above energy policy and and and, and you know the his fans were so happy about it you know they didn't notice you know because i think partly because they didn't want to and partly because it just wasn't reported very widely that basically his program was about giving uh subsidies to large corporations to build large projects and there wasn't really anything for individual homeowners right or right or or individual business or building owners which is where it needs to happen you know so like here's some money so that uh, you can go in and everybody's got double paned windows, you know, right? Here's mm -hmm. some money so that everyone can have insulation blown into their walls, you know, mm -hmm. like and, and decrease the need for it. So and because, you know, I have a friend who was an activist in uh, 350.org in, in, in Portland, which was far more radical than their national organization. And the point he likes to bring up over and over again is that we put in the wind and we put in the solar and it's not replacing anything. It's always right. adding. They're not, right. they're not, yeah, they're not like, it's, oh, look, we've got this new wind thing. Now we can shut down this coal plant. Yes, it's Jevons paradox. It's like what I've seen in when I used to live in large cities um, and there was always unbelievable congestion and they'd add an extra lane mm -hmm. to the freeway or the highway or the belt line. And then inevitably there'd be more cars and it would be just as much congestion and within no time. You know, it's increasing efficiency just to consume more. And that is what always happens. And that's what's been happening, yeah, with green energy or, or re renewable energy. Um, and then there's the other thing in terms of, like, personal homes. Um, and again, the, I'm not an expert on this, but there are so many people who've worked on passive solar designs and ways that I mean, there are homes in, in New Mexico. Oh, I'm forgetting the man who created them. He calls them earth ships. The homes are created with um, plastic waste. Is the, the plastic bottles is what he starts with. And I believe then he uses clay around that. But he has a whole system where you don't even need air conditioning or um, heat it's all generated because of passive solar design and and recirculation. And there are actually growing plants and trees incorporated inside the home. And it's unbelievable. So it 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 um, it uh, it takes away the need. It uh, obliviates the need for energy systems because the sun is doing it on its own and not even with solar panels just through the windows. Yeah, absolutely. It's all these, you know, small scale and very local solutions that are, what would need to be that would need to be applied to actually to do to do this, you know, and I mean, but cutting, a lot of times mm -hmm. these solutions, you know, it takes away um, 
the money that goes into the the power system, you know, and whoever owns those energy systems. And it takes away um, a lot of the money that goes toward certain capitalist industries. And so it's thwarted by the government. It's often not even allowed, you know, they'll, they'll keep, like you said, there, that Obama gave all this money to big, huge scale renewable energy projects instead of small scale ones. So, you know, there are regulations that keep people from actually implementing these simple solutions because there's money to be made and it will take away from certain industries and certain sectors of industries. And um, again, it's, it's, we have to maintain our capitalist endeavor and our economic growth. And that's why these things are not allowed, these true solutions. But of course, maintaining that capitalism and economic growth is what is making us completely unsustainable. In a state of shock after the war, we interrupt our program for a brief message. If you appreciate this podcast, please consider supporting Colibri on Patreon. Just go to patreon.com slash Colibri. That's K-O-L-L-I-B-R-I. And now, back to our regularly scheduled... And the love affair that exists pretty much across the board politically for technology in general in the popular mind is also a big part of this without uh, understanding the actual nature uh, of technology. And I was um, thinking about the questions that you had put in the email to me yesterday about for our talk today. And I went through my bookshelf and I found a book. Have you heard of, you've probably heard of the author, Jerry Mander. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. So yeah, he's got a book called in, Ab- in the absence of the sacred, which you've probably read, but um, I haven't read it. I've heard about it though. Oh, that's a good one. So anyway, he, he, he's talking about, there's this part in here that I really thought was pretty amazing that I don't hear people talk about much. Uh, this is under a heading called technology's pervasiveness and invisibility. And mm-hmm. he says, Marshall McLuhan told us to think of all technology in environmental terms because of the way it envelops us and becomes difficult to perceive. From morning to night, we walk through a world that is totally manufactured, a creation of human invention. We are surrounded by pavement, machinery, gigantic concrete structures, automobiles, airplanes, computers, appliances, television, electric lights, artificial air have become the physical universe with which our senses interact. They are what we touch, observe, react to. They are themselves information in that they shape how we think and, in the absence of an, alt- of an alternate reality, that is nature, what we think about and know. As we, as we relate to these objects of our own creation, we begin to merge with them and assume some of their characteristics ourselves. Yes, and I'm trying to look at, when was that book written? Uh, let's see. It was uh, probably the 80s or the 90s. I believe, 90s, it, was the, I believe it was the 90s. Let's see. Yeah. 90, 90, copyright 91. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's what I thought. So, I mean, imagine 91, we really didn't, we had only the beginnings of the internet. Most of us weren't on it. Right. So imagine how that's changed. Our lives are completely devoted to all these devices now, basically. Yes. And during this pandemic, it is only proliferated. And for those of us who, you know, kind of operate from an ecological viewpoint from, you know, every day when we wake up and throughout the day, it's so alarming. And it's it just feels like no one is even thinking about it. We've, we've migrated toward education with all these devices, the amount of electronics that are in everybody's home and that we must be producing to have everybody have these things. And, you know, I can't even imagine the billions of smartphones and tablets and laptops that we've created and all the other peripherals that go with it. And we don't think of the energy it takes to keep this whole thing up through the internet. We don't think of the resources it it takes to make these things. We don't think of as you said, with all of the people mining for the materials and the slave labor and child labor, mostly in Africa, we don't think of the waste of these materials at the end of their life. And the e-waste problem is 
unbelievable all of these these products going to the third world being you know decommissioned and taken apart uh, toxic heavy metals being burned and their fumes causing cancer to all these poor people I mean it is a horror that we just go on and we we just think this is okay and it's it was I was thinking about this because it's really funny to me that um, people are concerned about like plastic bags and straws, which I totally agree with. And, you know, for those of us who've been in this for a long time, I don't know about you, but I mean, I, speaking of that book at 1991, that was right around the time when I got my first cloth bags for shopping. And I've been using them ever since for all the shopping I do. So that's like almost 30 years ago. So I mean, yeah, our plastic bag problem at grocery stores is huge, and it's great that we're tackling that, and it's great that we're trying to ban straws. But then we don't even think of these incredibly toxic plastic devices that we're living our lives on every day, and you know the resources they take, the plastic, the the toxic in, the toxic out, and and then the energy, and even if it's even if it eventually becomes all so quote unquote clean energy, as we've just talked about, that energy isn't completely clean, and there's so many other problems um, with these these actual devices other than the energy use. But it's just it's just so unsustainable, and it's so um, pushed to the outskirts of our mind, or not even near our minds at all. Yes, because we're further and further insulated from reality, that is, yeah. from, from nature, by these things, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, first of all, just for being physically surrounded by them, as, as Gerrymander points out here that McLuhan was talking about. But then uh, the, the, mental, the mental clutter of it, yeah. you know, is greater and greater all the time, too. Because, mm -hmm. you know, he was, of course, writing before we were all carrying around computers in our pockets or our palms, mm -hmm. you know, all the time, everywhere that we go, which is, you know, had a, a tremendous effect on society that's, for the most part, gone unremarked upon. Um, speaking of that, yeah, it has gone unremarked upon, but I do want to recommend a couple of uh, books or people who've written about this. There's a great book called The Shallows, and I have to remember. Oh, I've heard of the, this. And he talks about, I'll, I'll look up um, real quickly who wrote that. He talks a lot about the um, emotional and psychological effects of this technology and the effects on our ways of thinking, which I know I don't, I don't even have a smartphone. I'm on my laptop far too much um, for personal and, you know, sort of professional reasons, but I... I, I see it doing things to my brain that I don't like, and I feel like I'm not even thinking about things the way I used to. Um, and so these devices are really affecting our brains. And um, there's a, I think she's either a psychologist or sociologist from MIT named Sherry Turkle, who's written a few books about this. I think one of them was called Alone Together. Oh, and I've, I've so heard there of that are too. people who are studying this, but often, you know, it's funny, she's from MIT, so you'd think she would get our attention and get the attention of mainstream media. But I think her message about the, you know, the issues with these things that we're all using all the time is not the message that people want put out there. Huh. Yeah, oh, wonder. so The Shallows is by Nicholas Carr, by the way. Okay. And I would highly recommend that book. Excellent. No, this one from MIT sounds fascinating. I wonder if I could talk to her on the show sometime. Yeah, that would be terrific. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, now, so, so you've lived, you know, uh, on the East Coast and the West Coast, uh, mm -hmm. as have I, and you've lived in urban areas and rural areas, you know, mm -hmm. um, as yep. have I. And, uh, I've noticed, I've noticed that, that there is definitely, I've noticed that the, that from the viewpoint of being in rural areas and spending lots of times, you know, away from a lot of this stuff that the people in cities are more and more insulated from nature all the time. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, so the proliferation of the computers that are, you know, supposedly connecting us to the rest of the world are not actually having that effect of connecting us to the rest of the world because the very fact of spending time with these machines is itself disconnecting. Mm -hmm. 
And so uh, people are perhaps learning more facts about things that are happening, like, oh, there's these fires in the Amazon and the Amazons are the lungs of the earth, etc. I mean, maybe they're knowing facts like that, but they're having fewer and fewer visceral physical experiences with the natural world, you know? So, I mean, uh, you know, we're about the same age and uh, uh, probably your childhood was similar to mine and that you spent, I mean, I spent a lot of time outdoors as a child, oh, yeah. you know? Yeah. And, and I was fortunate. I, I resented it at the time, but now I realize it was good. I, I was fortunate that my parents um, uh, severely limited my television time as well, mm -hmm. you know, to, mm -hmm. to only a certain amount per day and then to only certain shows, you know? And I was always, yeah. you know, told, go outside, go run around the block, go, you know what I mean? Yeah. So I would... Yeah. And so I, so I did that. And I see now that people are not having, children are not having that kind of childhood anymore. There, very few of them are being limited in this way, you know, with, with okay. their, with their, with their screen time. And the, the lack, the lack of interacting with non-human things, uh, leads to, I mean, well, honestly, it leads to some sort of shared, collective uh mental illness oh absolutely and and you know it's funny because um when we were kids I, I remember in the summer i lived in this condominium complex and there were a lot of children there so it was easy to just step outside and find someone to play with right and and we'd go out you know first thing in the morning and we would play all day and maybe come home for lunch and then play till um, our mothers, usually our mothers back then in, in the early days, our mothers weren't working. It was kind of that time before all the women went back to work, um, to show how old I am. All right. Um, but, uh, you know, someone would call us for dinner and then we'd even go back outside afterwards. Yep. And, and the funny thing was, I think a lot of us like TV, but it was even more fun to be outside. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, and there's something that's so missing, you know, socially, and and there's so many studies to say how much better you are emotionally and physically to be out in nature. Um, studies about, you know, allergies and all sorts of things that, you know, children aren't exposed to dirt and, and even pathogens that are just naturally out there that when they're playing outside all the time. But beyond that, you know, you were saying we have these access to all this information. Um, first of all, I think something the Shallows talks about is that we don't remember information as much anymore because we know it's at our fingertips. So things we used to have to retrieve from our brains, we go straight to the smartphone or the computer to retrieve. So we don't have that information anymore. And it's so fleeting, too. I was just thinking the other day, that um because I was listening to something going on with the Black Lives Matters protests in in Rochester, New York. And I was thinking, oh, Rochester, I think, was where this um seventy year old man was pushed down by the police and and he he had a head injury and it was bleeding from his head. And I thought, wow, I wonder what happened to that man because we have all of this information and all of this news all the time through our various media sources, but we never follow up on anything so it's just like this instant fact and then it's gone and i'm not sure what that does to us either the news media has uh, the television news has worked like that for a long time and i think yeah. that that really all that's changed there is the speed you know mm -hmm. uh, there, there's more edits now it's more rapid fire you know absolutely yeah but, but they've always tended to 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 um go towards the the spectacle, you know, and not go for anything deep. You might remember the Don Henley song from the 80s, Dirty Laundry. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah, that was that was, you know, we've got the bubble headed bleach blonde comes on at five. She can tell you about the plane crash with the gleam in her eye, you know, like, yeah. yeah so so it's really only gotten more sophisticated, uh, which is to say more shallow, you know, and and now we just have more of it. So we're getting constant facts and constant this and that, but, you know, never in context. Right. Or with a greater picture. But beyond that, I was also going to say that I know as an educator that it's it's amazing to me because I I grew up and went through my undergraduate years without 
the internet. And so we had, a, we had different ways of finding information and writing our papers and doing all that. But, um, and I just keep thinking how different things would have been if I had this information at my fingertips. However, when it comes to teaching students, they use the Internet for social media and so many other forms of communication. But when it comes to actually finding information, a lot of them have trouble gathering that very information they need for their education, which is really interesting because it's all there in ways that uh, anybody who's like generic generation X and younger did not have. And yet it's not even really utilized all that much, or it's not utilized to the extent that it could be. Yeah. And one thing that I haven't heard many people talk about, but which I feel like I've noticed is that the internet is actually less useful now for that kind of information than it was, say, around the turn of the century and like the early 2000s. Mm -hmm. And that's because of like glut, basically, you know, Yeah, I was just going to say that I think and I think this goes I have to say, I think this goes with research and all of the big data. There is just too much information and no one can process all this. It's way too overwhelming. And it's it's very hard, especially if you're younger and are still sort of learning um, how to think and how to process information to choose what is important, what's relevant, and what is not. Because there is just too much of it out there. And maybe that's by design. Maybe that's a great way to distract us from, from you know, what we need to prioritize in our lives and in our societies. Right, right. Because in terms of prioritization, what we collectively need to be prioritizing right now is the, the planet, is, is our ecology, you know, is the the environmental health, you know, of of this place that we're living. And that is the part that people are more and more separated from, you know, and, and mm -hmm. I find that I find that, you know, that it feels to me like a lot of my work that I do with my writing and my photography and now with this podcast is is a lot of times I feel like I'm just trying to remind city people that uh, a world exists outside the cities. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and it, that takes us sort of back full circle when it comes to priorities, because when and when we're talking about sustainability and when we're talking about pretty much anything in the lives of first world peoples, our priority is always economic. Um, and that is why sustainability is defined by all of our institutions within the lens of economics right so rather than having a foundation in ecology which is which is the foundation of our lives of our civilizations of everything are we've made a foundation of economics which is an artificial system which can be altered in any way we want and can change and be thrown away at any time we want but that is the foundation of all of our environmental policies, of everything. And as long as that's the way it's going, it's very unlikely we will ever be truly sustainable. And it's very unlikely we are going to be able to save ourselves from, you know, this inevitable climate catastrophe. I mean, and it's going to be, you know, we're not going to be able to completely reverse climate change. And we're not going to be able to completely reverse all this toxification we've done with the planets, particularly with pesticides and with plastics, but we can do so much more to mitigate it and to um, perhaps make a livable future for all of our descendants. But it's not going to happen as long as economics is the foundations of everything we do. And we forget there's, there's natural systems with real true laws that we can't defy. Um, and, you know, as long as we go on that way, it's going to be very difficult to to truly have any kind of sustainability. Right. Because because, yeah, I, I appreciate how you put that, that e ecology is where that that's that's truly where where we live. That's truly that's what's really real. And then the economics is a is a is an overlay uh, put on top of that, that, yes, we can change however we want. And people, you know, act as though. Uh, capitalism is, you know, inevitable. But obviously, yes, I mean, we could we could change that overnight. 
if we felt like if we wanted to, whereas the ecological conditions uh, we uh, cannot change overnight. That has its own pattern that's going on. And in that sense, uh, we're not. It's not that we're separate from nature because there's no such thing as being separate from nature, right? It's just that our perception of ourselves, our, our perception of our connection to nature has changed. Mm -hmm. Because we're no less connected to nature now than we ever have been, right? We're still mm -hmm. entirely dependent on the environment and, and, and the planet. It's just that we have, have come to believe collectively that... It, that we're not or that it doesn't matter somehow. Mm -hmm. and, and and actually I've, I've talked to people and I've said, you know, uh, w everything we do is reliant on, on ecology, on ecosystems and natural resources, you know, and it's, it's an, someone said to me, Oh, natural resources have nothing to do with anything. And I'm thinking every Thing we use day to day, everything that goes into our bodies, everything we breathe, everything we eat, everything we manufacture comes from our natural resources. How can you say that that this has nothing to do? It's it is the foundation of our civilization, and it's the foundation of humanity. Um, so, and and at a at a very simple level, um, you know, the the process that keeps humans going is cellular respiration. Mm -hmm. You know, it's the respiration that every one of our cells does to create energy. And in order to do that, we need food, um, basically in the form of carbohydrate, but our food is broken down into that, and we need oxygen. And as long as we have those two things, we can keep going. But but if we, if we, create problems with our food and our oxygen. Of course, we also need water to survive. We, that's the foundation of all life on earth, or at least human life on earth and, and most of animal life on earth. So, I mean, we, it's so funny that we forget these simple things that are imperative to our survival. Yeah. And collectively we're forgetting them because uh, uh, most people are living in settings that are that are so human made again, mm -hmm. you know, so cut off from these things. And at this point, I don't think that most rural people are that much more connected than city people are because rural people are also carrying around the cell phones. Rural people right. are also getting all of their food from the grocery store, you know, like. Right. Uh, I, I'm, I'm, you know, continually shocked when I travel through agricultural areas, even areas that have uh, smaller holdings, how few vegetable gardens that you see, you know, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's become rarer and rarer to see that sort of thing. Most people really are dependent on entirely dependent on the, the system at this point. There's so few people who are providing, you know, for themselves, you know, directly to a significant degree, you know? And there's, and you know, there's two factors involved in that. I think there's socioeconomic factors. And I was, that's funny you said that because I was driving through a, a pretty wealthy area around here um, just yesterday. And I was noting, I was looking at some of these humongous houses and noting some of their really nice vegetable gardens. And I was thinking how ironic it is that these people who have all this money have a beautiful vegetable garden and they can afford any food they want and they're but and that they also have the land and the ability and the time to grow their own food and then the the poorest of people do not have any land do not have any space you know probably don't have any um you know green space at all to have a garden and they're the ones who could use a garden the most to have nutritious food and who, who are you know, struggling to afford food from the grocery store to begin with. So these are socioeconomic factors that, you know, flip everything completely around from what it should be. But beyond that, um, there's also this cultural thing that's been ingrained in us about how we live and we get our food from the grocery store. I'll never forget 
Um, for a long time, I, I've never been able to have, you know, a backyard with chickens or something, but I've lived in places where friends and neighbors have had chickens and they're, they're laying eggs. And I've had many people um, give or sell my husband and I eggs. And this one, this one um, acquaintance once brought eggs from, I think, her family's small farm or, or large garden or something. And she gave them to us and she said, you know, I really don't like these. I have to get my eggs at the grocery store. It just feels all wrong or something. And I thought that's how disconnected we've become that the eggs at the grocery store are so normalized and she wants to give away the wonderful fresh eggs that were just, you know, laid in her family's home. Wow. But, wow. Yeah, this is this is sort of what the mind control we have in in our way of life and what we're told is supposed to be normal in our way of life. Too. Right. Right. Well, let's let's starting from food then, I think. Let's let's talk about what real actual sustainability would really look like, right? And mm -hmm. and let's let's put aside any notions, you know, for a moment of of how practical we think it might be to get there or that other people might think that it get to be to get there but actually just talk about what it would look like right so and 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 starting with food uh because i've given this one so much thought and and mm -hmm. you know and and you know and and being a small farmer and and working in agriculture so much i've really looked at it a lot and uh first of all we have a nation where uh, it's only about 1% or less than 1% of the whole population is actually involved directly with agriculture, right? Right. And if you go back to like the 30s, so not even 100 years ago, uh, it was something like 30% of the population was involved in agriculture, right? Right. And so that's the first thing that needs to change to go towards the more, I would say, to, to, to build a more sustainable culture is that a lot more people need to be involved in agriculture because it all needs to be done by hand a lot more than it currently mm -hmm. is the, yep. the 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 large industrial agriculture as it currently exists with the huge machines and all the inputs and i mean it's just it's not working for any number of reasons that we could do three or four podcasts on right yep. you know and so the fertilizers mm -hmm. the pesticides the machinery all completely unsustainable all detrimental to our health all you know part of promoting climate change and right. intoxifying the planet. Yep. Right, right. And, and small, small farms, you know, are, are no less efficient than large ones on yep. an acre by acre Probably basis. Probably more. Probably more. Probably more efficient, especially when you're growing a multitude of crops rather than just one monoculture. Right, right. Like, and there's, there's studies, including you at United Nations studies that have shown that, like, that's just, that's just true. Right. So the United Nations is really promoting agroecology. And beyond that, you know, I've talked about this and, and when I was in graduate school, professors just threw out the notion, but we waste 40% of our food. Oh, heavens, so yeah. we don't need efficiency. We, we are, we have plenty of food, you know, we need well, you know, if we're saying we want to be sustainable, it is a distribution problem right now, but we don't want to have the distribution. We want to have everybody growing food locally because then you wouldn't have the distribution problem at all. Yeah. So I would, I would but start there. But it's also there. waste. Yeah. No, it's definitely totally waste. So yeah, I would start there with food. Where, where would you, what else would you put out there for what a, a truly sustainable culture would look like? Well, like you said, I think, I think, I, I think pretty much everybody should be growing food. I mean, and, I, and and as we talked about getting back to nature, it brings you back to being in touch with, you know, some of the natural world. And most people who grow food, vegetables, and, you know, there's so many people who, um, there are many people who say they don't like vegetables, so that's hard. But there's so many people, you know, at least they'll like tomatoes or something. And, and it, I think most people enjoy growing their own food. Um, those of us who've grown our own food know how much better it can taste, how much fresher and, um, and more nutritious it is. But of course, we don't all have access to land and there's all these issues. But if, we, if everything were ideal, yes, I think we should all grow our own food. And that would mean that we all need to be working less 
in these jobs that are not really doing much of anything and also jobs that are promoting more harm in the world. So it, we need to have the time to grow our own food. We need to have the space to grow our own food. And we need to, and we need to um, be open to eating real food too, which I think in my lifetime, that's become probably since the maybe late 80s, early 90s, it's probably become more of a, a big thing for people to eat real foods. But uh, maybe there needs to be more regulation on this industrial food system and all of these mass produced food products, because that's another aspect of the food system where we have all these food products that Probably all of us have eaten at one time or another. I know when I was really little, you know, for me, a treat was to have a Twinkie once in a while. Uh, and, right. it, you know, it wasn't something my parents would allow me to eat very often. Once in a great while, it was something. But, you know, that really doesn't need to exist. Not only is it not food, not nutritious, it's putting just absolute junk in your body. But it's has all this, first of all, it's mass produced in an industrial system that also doesn't need to exist. And it's wrapped in plastic. And if we're really looking towards sustainability, these things really cannot exist. We can't pretend we can find alternatives to them, alternatives to a Twinkie. Well, actually, you might be able to find an alternative to a Twinkie using natural ingredients that is not all chemicals, but not a Twinkie product that comes from a factory and is shipped all across the country. Um, you know, this stuff doesn't need to exist. And, and, and actually, you know, I'm thinking, like I said, you, you might find an alternative to a Twinkie. When I was living in Wisconsin, there was this wonderful little bakery and, you know, everything was handmade in small little batches. And the, the pastry chef there did make like an, her own, um, oh, what are those things? Pop tarts, which I've never actually uh -huh. eaten in my life, but she made her own pop tart, which was just made of um, uh, a pie shell and a wonderful fruit filling. And I think they all she used to use, make her own jellies, and those were put in the in her version of the pop tarts. And they used to make a lot of pastries that were versions of these sort of industrial made things, but they're all natural and they're all from the earth, and they don't have any packaging, and that's sustainability. Right. Yeah. So we really need to look at the food we eat and how we eat. And it doesn't mean we don't have to enjoy our food because I am someone, I'm from an Italian background and I enjoy food and I enjoy eating. But I also, you know, I want to be sustainable in the way I eat. And there's so many different ways to do that, but certainly not with a huge industrial agriculture system, certainly not with a, a huge industrial food industry and, you know, all of these packaged products that probably shouldn't even exist. And, you know, again, we're about the same age. And when you think about our childhood, and we had plenty of packaged products, the amount that they have now for every Twinkie we have there, there's like 10 different varieties of Twinkie now, you yeah. know, it's just incredible. And this stuff, there's no way any of it is sustainable. Right. So let's look at uh, another piece. How about um, technology in terms of consumer technology how much of that has to go oh gosh you know i i really don't see how so much of any of this is sustainable and right. that's what we really we're really um we're really trying trying to just put our hand put our fingers in our ears and go la 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 i don't want to hear about it because there is nothing about you know our computers our phones our even our televisions, all of this stuff that is anyway sustainable, as we talked about all, all already from where the, the resources to create these things come from in our mind to the end products. And unless, um, unless we start adopting this sort of circular economy and this cradle to cradle idea that was brought up in the 90s of, you know, your product that has been created, every single piece of it should be reused and repurposed into something else. And again, this is something that's coming out as sort of a new idea of a circular economy now in terms of sustainability, but it really came out in the 1990s and it was talked about as cradle to cradle systems for products. Unless we do that and we take everything we have now created and stop creating it anew and using what we have to keep 
you know, keep all the pieces and components within the system. It's completely unsustainable. Even doing that might not be all that sustainable, but being that we've created all this stuff already, that's the only path toward real sustainability. Right, right. And I, I wonder if, you know, for example, uh, a place could still a place could still be made for radio, for example, you know, like mm -hmm. we had radios that used um, tubes, you know, yeah, like before transistor radios, right? So mm -hmm. so radios weren't really electronic in that in that sense. At one time, they were merely electric, if you know what I mean, right? right? And so right. So, you know, and you've probably seen the old big console ones, but they made smaller ones, too, that were just tube radios, you know. And so so perhaps, you know, uh, uh, um, some kind of communication uh, network like that could still exist uh, and be kept somewhat sustainable, you know, because there could be a use for that for, say, emergency stuff, you know, mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. that, OK, it's going to go out over the radio that, you know, well, there's this hurricane about to hit the coast or whatever, like get out or lay low. Like, you know, I can see a need for that kind of thing, you know, uh, where where perhaps some room could be made for, for something something like that. But I think that, you know, well, we could entirely live without television. Mm -hmm. You know, for example, that could just go, that could just go out the window. That's just been a propaganda device from day one, you know, right. that's that's never really, I mean, any, Anything beneficial that's come out of that has been so infinitesimally small compared to the damage that it's done to society as as a whole, you know, and, and continues right. to do. And and you know, I, I recall that uh, um, before all the streaming stuff happened, right online, mm -hmm. when online was still just you know, I mean, you had the World Wide Web, but you still it was still text based for the most part, like right. people weren't watching movies or television, like in the late 90s, right? right. Like in the late 90s, I recall there being a, a time there when uh, among people who considered themselves intellectual, or maybe who considered themselves liberal, there was a, a pride that was taken in how little television one watched, you know? Mm -hmm. And this mm -hmm. was a small group of people, but it was there, you know, but like, oh, like, yeah, I don't watch that anymore. I don't even have a TV or I only have a TV for renting movies was was one you'd hear sometimes, you know. And so there was a pride that was taken in not watching that. But then I noticed that some of those very people became re-addicted when streaming started online, yeah. you know, and it's like, well, no, that's still television, you yeah. know, just because it's not. You know, it doesn't have as many commercials and just because it's coming through a different device, you know, doesn't mean it's not still just utter crap, you know, like. And yeah, I think this goes back to what we were talking about in terms of priorities. Of course, we want to have some um, frivolous entertainment in our lives in some ways to decompress and and stuff. But I think what has happened in our society, and again, probably purposefully, is that this frivolous entertainment and this sort of gratuitous stuff has taken precedence over so much else in our lives. So, you know, and, and again, the gratuitous stuff, like the all, I mean, I can't even fathom how many channels are on television and how many places you can get streaming services and all of this stuff and, and how, how any of us even choose what we might want to watch when we ever have time to watch anything. It's just unbelievable. And then you think of the, and then you have to think of how sustainable it is to create all of these programs and all of these movies. And, Definitely. you know, I lived out in Los Angeles and I have witnessed how Hollywood works and it's a, it's a completely unsustainable industry as well. Right. So, you know, and as is pretty much every industry, every industry that we think of as good or bad or frivolous. And we really need to address this in every field, in every industry. When I think that the urge for the frivolousness, well, for it's, it's really, it's escapism is what it is. It's an urge for escapism, right? right? And so right. we have the urge towards escapism because uh, the culture that we live in is, is so fucking oppressive to begin with. Right. Right. So you create a culture that's not so oppressive, and then there's not the need for escapism. Now, there still would be 
you know, a desire. Well, in that case, we can, we can separate frivolity from escapism and be like, well, yes, there's also just having a good time, you know? Mm -hmm. There's like, oh, hey, you know, we all spent the whole day out there, you know, planting or harvesting such and such. And, and now there's a full moon and we're going to sit around a fire with, you know, a guitar and some drums and, 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 you know, what have you. I mean, that's great. You know, like, I, I mean, like, that would be where we would be going with these things, you know, mm -hmm. would be the real, the real thing again, you know, and I, I've experienced, you know, I've had experiences like that and evenings like that and being camped out with a bunch of people and et cetera. And, you know, there's like, it, it's just, it, it's, it's frustrating uh, to me how, how there's seemingly fewer opportunities for this now than there, yeah. than there, there were, you know, before too, and so there's fewer people having those experiences because I personally I'm convinced that that uh, most people would be happier with a simpler life. Yes, I I absolutely agree, and and you know it's not to tell people how this should be not to all. be sustainable and and what where you should find your joy or your escapism or your peace. But it's a matter of that, you know, we are really being delusional if we think all of these things that we've come to um, expect in our society and in our culture are, are going to be able to keep going if we want our ecological systems and our life support system, meaning our biosphere, to also keep going. It's right. just not they're just not compatible. Right. So there's a, there's so many ways we can imagine a different future and a simpler future that probably most of us would want, but it's not going to be a highly technological future. And when we, you know, again, when I hear things about like the smart grid is the solution, does it, do, I don't think people really realize how much energy and resources this internet and all of these smart technologies require. And even if they were done on a renewable energy basis, so the, just the resource use and the space they take up, and it's just, again, completely ecologically unsustainable. And we just have to rethink these kinds of things and be open to alternatives, which would probably make most of us much more happy and much less overwhelmed and stressed and psychologically um harried. I mean, the, the amount of anxiety and depression in our society that almost all of us have experienced in our lives is unbelievable. And it's, it's not a product of um, unbalanced um, chemistry in your brain. And it's not a product of just you being a flawed human being. It's so much of it is a product of our culture as a whole and of societal cues and everything going on around us. Yes, because we're we're behaving in a lot of the same ways that animals do when they're put in cages. Right. 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 And we are we are in this we are in this cage of technology and, and right. of being in a screen all day. It, it almost literally is like a cage. Right. I, I mean, I feel as though modern culture is a cage. Yes. Yes, I sure do too. Yeah. That that's my experience with it, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I I think that cuz yeah, you look around and and just the number of people who are unhappy or or are depressed, you know? Like mm -hmm. that really speaks to something and who really wants to have an hour long commute in a car both ways every day? Right? Mm -hmm. I mean, who wants that? So 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 the cities all need to be rejiggered too. I mean, for a city to really be sustainable, uh, it's going to look completely different than it does now. It's not going to involve uh, lots of people moving large distances over that city every day. That means all the cities need to be rejiggered so that they've got uh, multiple centers to them, you know, mm -hmm. where, where, where people are so, so that no one's traveling as far as they, they, they currently are now because we just can't afford we can't afford that kind of travel anymore. Yeah, I, you know, I don't have all the solutions. Obviously, none of us do. But I think we we need to um, think more about the potential solutions in terms of not continually adding more layers and more technology 
that we think is going to save us and rather peeling a lot of this back and simplifying. Um, Ulrich Beck talks about the modern risks or the, the world risk society. And it's, it's, we've created all of these risks because of how complex we've made our society. And a lot of this is industry and technology and, and I don't think there's any way out of it by adding more industry and more technology and more entrepreneurship and all these things that we think are going to be our salvation. I think what we need to do is peel all of this back and really simplify the way we do things. And I think it would bring so much more satisfaction for everyone, so much more equality for everyone, and so much more um, psychological well-being and physical and emotional well-being, too. Right, right. Well, because everything would be relocalized. And with a relocalization, uh, and, and there being small scale efforts to work on everything, everyone would then see their own contribution uh, as being a more significant part of their lives, right? Mm -hmm. So if, if you know, you have a, a, a small Let's say, let's say that there's a suburb of a big city where they're like, okay, great. Uh, we're going to take that baseball diamond and now that's farming. We're going to take this golf course. Now that's farming. Okay. We're now centered around this. Like those people now, like the, their own efforts are noticeably contributing to their own well being and to the well being of their neighbors. Right. Yeah. Uh, because right now the, the contributions that people are making in terms of their time and their energy have very little noticeable effect, right? Like mm -hmm. what they're getting out of it is is money and not enough of that to be useful and a lot of their time taken away, right? And so 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 people are are feeling their entire lives being stolen from them uh, whether they consciously think about it that way or not this is i think the feeling that a lot of people have yep. right and so yep. so then contrast that with a life where people feel as though what they are doing is they're contributing and they're giving to something from which they're getting something back right right and and they're seeing how they're actually making a difference as well and like how that would really change things once you see that oh here's a context in which i really am making a difference you know yeah and i and i think people are really yearning for that for that kind of meaning in their lives and also uh, the things you're talking about are everybody's contributing to the basic needs of everyone else. And when you're, when you're helping everyone else sustain their basic needs, what could be more meaningful than that? I mean, I think at a certain level, we all know that's where all the meaning comes from. You know, all these things above those basic needs, that's great, you know, contributing intellectually and stuff. That And it's always wonderful to hear about how, you know, you and I as writers, how our writing has um, affected people. But, you know, th there are, if you're really contributing to helping people just basically live their lives and get by, what could be more fulfilling than that? Yeah, I mean, I, I fundamentally, I think that that's probably what being human is actually about. Yes, yes. Yes. And I think so. And so many of us are feeling unfulfilled and feeling little meaning in our lives because in truth there really isn't much meaning we're, we're just a cog in this machine and we're contributing to the wealth of all these people at the top who are exploiting us and and none of us really want to be that right and this is a, a denial and a repression of our humanity not mm -hmm. as some cynical people would claim an expression of it Mm-hmm. Exactly. Because you hear that, that like, oh, humans are, you know, greedy by nature. Humans are destructive by nature. So, of course, we're destroying the planet, you know, uh, of, of, of course, we're take you know, using things up more than they can be replaced by, you know, I mean, there is that point of view. But I, I, I've never disagreed. I've never agreed with that, with that, well, with that it, point of view. I think we have plenty of evidence to to shut that down with because if you look at indigenous cultures, they don't live that way, or at least not all of them do. And you can, you can't compare the way certain indigenous cult, indigenous cultures have lived on this planet for millennia, and and been 
practically as sustainable as you can imagine, and then compare that to our lives. I mean, and in, and in addition to sustainability, there's cultures that, you know, shun uh, people who are selfish and greedy and who are not collectively um, contributing to the group and all of these things that, that we pretend, oh, individuality is just how we are and selfishness and greediness and, and wanting more. And I think there's plenty of historical evidence to show that none of that is innate and also biological evidence, you know, to show that it's not innate in other species either and nor does it have to be an innate in humans. Yeah, I feel like if people want um, a direction to go or if they want a model or if they want suggestions, I think that uh, that's where people should go is 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 but is to look at indigenous peoples and their systems, you know, both in the past and in and in the present. Mm -hmm. I Absolutely. think that's our best that's our best example to go by. I mean, and there's so much more that we didn't even get to, but, you know, there's evidence to suggest that there was indigenous cultures, and I, don't, I believe in South America that were studied, that have no heart disease whatsoever, virtually no cancer. And, and, and we pretend that these just are inevitabilities instead of a product of our societal industrial system. Right. Yeah. Because, of course, people are like, oh, but technology has helped us to find treatments for cancer. And it's like, uh, it's the technical log lo technological lifestyle that caused cancer. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And so it's like it, and for me and and in what I studied in as a graduate student, it, it I would say it's hard to even describe the things I studied because I was kind of interdisciplinary. But I would say a big focus was on prevention and precaution. And so we look at sort of the medical industry as a savior for us. And, and when I look at medicine, I think it, it should be something that we need rarely, and we should be living a life where we, um, we obviate the need for medicine. And it's only something that is, you know, at the extreme, but most of the time, we're living a life where medicine isn't needed. And I don't think that's, an impossibility. And I don't think that's so idealistic. I think we've just sort of lost touch with, you know, what, where humanity is now and where it has been in the past. Yeah. Yeah, we have. Voices for Nature and Peace is produced in the Gila River Valley, New Mexico, USA, on land that we acknowledge is illegally occupied Apache territory. The intro music is Zero G Yogi by Big Z, with narration by Kelly Moody of the Ground Shots podcast. This outro music is Trip A, also by Big Z. Commercial break narration by Nikki Hill. To become a financial supporter of this podcast, and to gain access to members-only content, visit patreon.com slash colibri. K-O-L-L-I-B-R-I. For more information on Radio Free Sunroot programming, please visit RadioFreeSunroot.com. Thank you for listening. May you find joy in your own nature and peace. <laughs>